All right, we're back. It's another Carolina podcast. Still in quarantine. Pearson Fowler here in the recording studio. West Mitchell, Chris Clark, still working from home. It's been a really long time. Really, really long time. And as much as it feels like with each passing week, I mean, this is the reality. With each passing week, we're getting closer to the other side of this thing. But it feels like we're starting to see more silver linings. Some places starting to open up around here where we are in Columbia and you know around the country as well. But we're also like really, really getting close to that dangerous zone where for most of the last eight weeks, there, there's been stuff to talk about. And we still have plenty of things to get to today in terms of recruiting notes for South Carolina. But we're getting to the kind of the point of no return. You know, the, the NFL free agency is all wrapped up. The NFL draft was a, not last weekend, but weekend before. Uh, these things are starting to dry up, and it seems like mostly people are just talking about Michael Jordan, which is great because there's a lot of content to be had there. And uh, like I said, we got um, you know plenty of things going on with South Carolina football in terms of news, but it just feels, uh, I guess, starting to feel strained the longer we go without having any actual live sports to talk about. Not even that we do a ton of that on this podcast around this time of year. I mean, we'd be doing this kind of off-season stuff anyway, but there's just not like the... Uh, the MLB regular season and the NBA playoffs and the NHL playoffs and the you know college baseball and things that we would normally have to uh, balance it out. So uh, I, I don't know where y'all stand. I don't know if y'all are like the uh, raring to get out of quarantine and y'all are going out to eat already kind of uh, kind of crew. It's starting to get a little bit long for me. I, again, I'm, I'm optimistic that the silver lining is close. But um, Wes, how are you maintaining your sanity now? As and, and maybe maybe it's not gotten long for you yet because I know you and Chris are still really busy, but. Um, is it getting long for you yet? And what are you doing to, to maintain your sanity? Yeah, uh, I'll admit it's gotten a little long for me, man. I'm, uh, I'm just ready for some live sports. I, I miss that aspect. I, um, uh, I haven't done the, you know, eat out in a crowd thing yet. I've, uh, I mean, I've been getting to go food like throughout the whole thing. Um, so I've still been sort of on that train. I, I may wait until I can, you know, until it's a little bit more open where, the restaurants are truly open and you know you can go sit down inside and, and I don't know how long we are away from that but so I, I'm still getting to go um but man I, I just miss uh you know being able to to flip a game on I mean I'm a big Braves fan but the thing I love about Major League Baseball is just sort of the the fact that you know it's not like football where you have to gear up your entire day for it mm-hmm. but it's really good just to, if you like baseball to flip on um at the end of the day when you're sort of winding down and you have something to watch and you know if it's a good game you leave it on if it's not you you move on to something else and I I just miss I miss those aspects and I uh you know like you said with with football there wouldn't really be a whole lot going on right now anyway but um but man I I miss some some live baseball and and I miss um I don't even go to the movies very much but that's something I've strangely found myself wishing I could do is just (laughs) go to the theater and watch a movie um, cause it's just, it's really not the same to, to watch at home. And even though I'm not like a huge movie goer, it's one of those things. Once you just can't do it, uh, you sort of realize the things you wish you could do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd love to go to a Fireflies game and, and watch. I'd love to go to a Carolina baseball game. Um, just all, you know, all the stuff like that would, would be really good right now. What are you watching at home? Your movies? Um, well, I'm, I'm a big show watcher, so I'm, I'm still on, um, I'm still finishing up Homeland. Um, I'm, I'm actually I'm on this show. Uh, I'm on this show called uh, Shit's Creek, which yeah, is not, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, that's pretty good. That yeah, that's not a. Uh, we're not putting the explicit rating on this one. That's spelled differently. <laughs> I'm even allowed um, to say that on my radio show. Yeah, it, and it's um it's on Netflix, and I it took me a second to get into it, but uh, I, it's actually really really funny. Uh, so I, that that's sort of. I sort of have been going back and forth. Homeland's like the more serious mm-hmm. show, and then that's sort of my my levity and and sort of uh, keep me sane stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure on movies, man. I I tell you what, I was I was never I was never like a Star Wars nerd as a kid. I mean, I watched them. Can you be a fan I'm without being actually, a nerd, or do you have to be a nerd if you like Star Wars? No, a, a Star Wars nerd <laughs> would be to me someone that's like way 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 into yeah like over the top into it which a lot the the great thing about those movies is that there are a lot of people that are like very very serious about their star wars so Mm -hmm. that being said i'm thinking about going through because i guess they're all on disney plus now Mm -hmm. i'm thinking about maybe going through and just watching all the movies um since i so you haven't seen any of them or just any of the new ones 
No, I mean, I, I saw him as a kid, but mm-hmm. I just didn't – like, I don't even remember. Like, people that – that's what I'm saying. People that are, like, super into Star Wars, they could tell you er- – all about it, every single plot point and exactly what happened. Like, I would remember sections, I'm sure, if I mm-hmm. turned it on, but I don't. I mean, it's been, I mean, I was literally a kid the last time I watched them, so it would it would almost, in a lot of ways, be like watching it for the first time for me. Well, that's exciting. Now, I mean, like, are, are you like Obi-Wan Kenobi, like Han Solo, or are you going to be like, oh, who's that? I don't know who that guy is. Or, or you at least have, like, that base level understanding of what's going on? No, I mean, I, I, mean, I think everybody at least knows I know those names. I, okay. Like I, I don't know a ton about their backgrounds, honestly. But that, I mean, That's like fine. I said, that would be um, an opportunity. And I saw, I saw what it, what is the first new one of the new, of the new trilogy? What was it called? Uh, Force Awakens. Yeah, I did. I did see it. Okay. Because uh, it was on Netflix for the longest time. I watched it and I actually enjoyed it. So now that was a while back. So now it's sort of like okay. Maybe I'll go back and just watch the whole thing. Hmm. Okay, very good. Um, Chris, is this getting long for you yet? Uh, the the Star Wars conversation was, but the quarantine. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, wow! So you're also not a Star Wars fan? Yeah. No, no, I, I zoned out for a second. Okay, good. Uh, no, I, I seriously, I thought though. So, <laughs> one of our relatives got my kids uh, a, a Disney Plus subscription for the quarantine period. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm tempted by like, okay, should I go back and watch all these Star Wars or all these Marvel movies or something? But mm-hmm. the kids are catching up on a bunch of Disney movies I haven't seen. And I've looked at a couple of them too with them when I have time. But, uh, yeah, but it, it's, it's not really gotten long. I mean, we we uh, we made a little trek yesterday to go get takeout at Old Cantina 76, mm-hmm. which was awesome. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Stop. Yep, stopped by and saw our friends at, at Craft and Draft and Irmo on the way back, and so um, it, it, it's been really for me. It's still been fine. Um, I would like to be able to see sports. I'm not going to get up at 5 a.m. to watch a Japanese baseball game or anything like that. I'm not that bad off at this point. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's where we're at. Still, still doing, still hanging in here. Doing pretty good. Still catching up on some shows. Season three of Ozark is about to begin. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife wanted to start Outer Banks, which has been surprisingly actually sort of entertaining. Uh, <laughs> I, I had low expectations. It's been entertaining, <laughs> actually. So. Um, sh- 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 all right. So you said something that I wanted to follow up on, but now I'm, I'm thinking about the TV show thing. Because uh, I, I watched the first season of Ozark, never watched two or three. I know everybody watched three when it came out like recently and loved it. Would you recommend two? And and obviously you haven't started three yet, so you can't recommend that. But you feel like there's some positive momentum for what now? For Ozark. Ozark. Oh yeah, yeah. Definitely. Sorry, I, I didn't know if you were talking about Star Wars. I was like, man, oh, I, yeah, I don't no, know sorry. about two or three or what number you're talking about with Star Wars. No, um, I mean the the entire show is is. <laughs> I mean, from start to finish, like everybody's talking about, I'm really pretty pumped about season three because uh, people are like, it really gets crazy at season three. The end of season three is crazy. And I'm like, man, there's already been a lot that's happened. Um, There's been a lot of like, what the heck just happened moments in that show. Mm. And so, uh, yeah, it it definitely, it's one of those where I didn't even realize season one and season two, and I think there's 10 episodes in each season. I didn't even realize especially when you're binge watching, you know, Mm -hmm. like I didn't even realize that it was transitioning from one season to another. Like it just sort of goes and every show that ends sort of gives you, you know, not necessarily a cliffhanger, but just something to look forward to in the next episode. So Mm -hmm. I would imagine I'll probably be on uh, episode one of season three tonight, if I had to guess. Good, good, good. All right, well, in terms of your watching habits, I know you said you're not going to wake up at 5 a.m. to watch a Japanese baseball game, which is fine. That probably makes sense. But what if I told you you could wake up at a normal time, say, you know, 9 or 10 a.m., and watch a German soccer game? And, Chris, I know you like soccer. Uh, yes, I would be totally fine with that. Now, I'm going to – this is bad on my part. So the Bundesliga is active or coming back? Or? I just got a notification like 30 minutes ago, maybe not even 30 minutes ago, as I was driving in, that the Bundesliga is back, which I think means uh, this weekend. I haven't even – I haven't checked. I don't watch much Bundesliga anyway. But 
I, I really might have to to give it a go. Oh, oh I'll, I'll be all over that, I guarantee you. And I, I watch it during the year, actually. Okay. It's, it's actually really good, hmm. in my opinion. So, Wes has now fallen asleep on the other line, probably. Yeah, from like Star Wars to Star Bundesliga. Wars. Wes, so. are you so star for sports? Do you watch a little Bundesliga? <clears throat> I don't know what that is. Okay, um, good yeah, start. If, I, um, <laughs> if I'm putting Chris to sleep with the Star Wars, then he uh, he definitely just returned the favor. But um, now I I don't uh, I don't know, guys. Honestly, and I you know here, here's the thing: if you if you're like me and you're not a big soccer thing, it's like sort of the cool thing to like overplay how much you dislike soccer. And I feel like the baseball fans and the soccer fans a lot of times are like sort of at odds with each other. Yeah, we're rivals. But, but honestly, honestly, I'm I'm going to be completely honest. I'm not going to overplay it. I at this point would probably give it a shot. Wow, there you go. Right. Not, I remember I'm, I'm, when, uh, there, there was a point last year where I like Wes told me random like I would tell him about soccer. He never ah whatever. But he there's this one time we were like getting lunch or something. He's like, man, I I've caught some of this game. I don't remember which game it was the other night. He's like, those dudes are amazing. And I was like, yes. Exactly. So, he, he at least re- appreciates and respects it, even yeah. if he doesn't necessarily enjoy it. Well, I I appreciate the athleticism involved, if yeah. that makes sense, mm-hmm. and the the ball, the the ability to control a ball without using your hands, like is um like just I know that's something that I, I guess if you watch soccer all the time, it's probably um just expected. But if you mm-hmm. if you don't watch it and then you just watch a little bit, you're like. These dudes are um, insanely athletic and coordinated to be able to do what they can do. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and I, you know, to the um, w- and w- which baseball league is it that uh, that you're talking about? Do you know the actual name of it, Pearson? That started up? Oh, I, I have no idea. I didn't even know it was started up. Um, oh yeah, e- ESPN is uh, is broadcasting live mm-hmm. baseball now uh, from some foreign league. But man, to me, for there, there's an aspect of sports, and here's what I'm learning. There's an aspect of sports. It's not just getting to see live competition. It's getting to see live competition of people you care about the outcome. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like um, would would watching two two random. Now, right now, yes, you you might watch. Um, I don't know Miami of Ohio football versus. Um, you know Idaho or something. I you know you might watch that now because we're starved. But there's there's something about college football or you know even Major League Baseball, the NFL. There's something about I feel like watching your team and your guys that you followed um, that make it mean more. So to to me, watching the Braves right now would be like I, I would maybe literally treat the first time the Braves are back, that game may get treated like a college football game for me. Like I'm going to actually uh, plan, like plan my day around it and maybe even grill out or something. Mm-hmm. Whereas some random dudes I've never heard of, even if they are professionals playing baseball, um, yes, it is athletic competition, but it just it's not the same if it's not individuals that you have some type of um, – investment in if that makes sense yeah no i mean that makes sense it, uh, otherwise it's it's totally like impersonal and it's totally detached which again there's like there's value to that and i'll watch like pretty much any soccer game just because i love the game of soccer um and I, you know i imagine you know some people feel like that with football that's why people get so excited for maction which like i don't really care that much about maction i watch very little you know wednesday night maction over the course of a college football season just because i'm like ah this is just not as good as what I'm used to watching, so I'm just I'm not going to waste my time watching it. And so, uh, don't ask me any Mac questions during the football season. That's the the takeaway from this. But uh, I, I uh, as Pearson I, sends us uh, soccer stuff to our, <laughs> our boot tech. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. Uh, I know this is like terrible for a podcast, but I just I sent you to, and someone just uh, someone just posted it on Instagram recently, and it's uh, it's an old it's from like I don't know probably four or five years ago. It's an old goal, and I don't know why exactly they reposted it, but it's my favorite goal ever. So Wes, if you want to see. I guess more of what it seems like you appreciate about soccer in terms of the uh, precision and athleticism. Just watch that. Uh, for those of you that are wondering what it is, it's uh, a goal that uh, Chelsea scored against Burnley. It was the first game of the season in, in like 2000, I don't know, 14 or 15, maybe uh, 16, something like that. And it's just, uh, it, it's unbelievable. And, and Chris, you'll also appreciate it as a soccer fan because you'll know how hard some of the things that they're doing 
uh, how hard some of those things are. But anyway, um, it's getting kind of long. Uh, the, that, that the Bundesliga is coming back. Like I, I don't know how much I'll watch it. You know, maybe a little bit here and there. I'm not going to necessarily follow it unless like Tommy and Jay and Eric and I all decide that we're going to just start covering the Bundesliga as if it were South Carolina football on the show. Um, but more than anything, it's like I, I just like knowing that there is an option, that there is something there to watch. You know, if Major League Baseball were back, I don't think I would watch you know, all hundred remaining Braves game or anything like that, just to, to catch up or make up for it or anything like that. But there's something comforting in knowing that things are uh, like returning a little bit to normal. So I, I guess that's where I stand. And Chris probably sounds like maybe where you are, if you're not like dying necessarily for live sports right now. No, I, I mean, I don't want to say dying. I, I would, I would like to see some live sports. Like I'm, I'm with Wes. I'd love to just be able to chill out with a Braves game or something like that. I, Right, but it's like it's like the yeah, option more than like you want to watch like binge watch yeah. fifty hours of sports. It's like I, I wish it was it were there because yeah. it's like it, it's kind of a comfort food for us, and we've been starved of that for a while. Yeah. And there was enough stuff to keep us afloat, but now it feels like uh oh, there's like now now we're now we're really we're we're getting to the point that I think we all thought we were going to be in for the last eight weeks, but haven't been because the NFL has kept us afloat. Exactly. Yeah, just having that option, and um, you know, Saturday, a Saturday morning soccer game or an afternoon baseball or whatever and um you know i think it's all just sort of piled on to where it's really cool to be able to have that stuff as an option you know nba um you know something i would catch you know at night etc and and all that sort of the pageantry that goes with it and just being able to relax and and watch a baseball game during the spring it, it just sort of matches so uh it's been unfortunate for sure i've missed it but um doing okay still so far i think there is there's some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of sports coming back. They'll, they'll be back, all of them eventually. Some of them already coming back, and so still doing fine with it. We don't talk any uh, really any professional sports on this podcast, and, and much less the NBA. But I'll just throw this out there as we look forward to different options. And we spent a good bit of time last week talking about the potential contingency plans for college football coming back, and empty stadiums are coming back later, playing short and schedule and. Uh, different things like that. What what the NBA has been talking about doing is moving the entire sports league down to Disney World. Did you see this? Obviously, this wouldn't be an option for college football, so it's not even like, or like really, well, we can't even really tie this back into what we're, we're talking about. But I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that because we didn't talk about it last week. It may have happened after last week. Basically, Disney said, hey, everything is shut down. Come back to Disney World or come to Disney World. It'll give us the opportunity to open up some hotels and some restaurants and have some jobs back for people that have been laid off or furloughed. And you can have your entire league quarantined, you know, with the players and their families and the athletic staffs and the coaching staff. And we can monitor everything and test everybody and basically squeeze the rest of our regular season and playoffs in in a closed down Disney World. I think that sounds like an amazing idea. And it's, I guess, similar to what baseball had initially proposed with playing in just like spring training parks around the country. Um, And now it seems like there's a couple other ways that baseball could go. But uh, Wes, you cool with uh, baseball doing that, you know, coming back in spring training parks only or, you know, playing three 10-team divisions or, like, the NBA coming back in Disney World, like all these crazy things that are going to be weird and in front of no fans, you're cool with that? Yeah, I think you have to be at this point, man. I, I mean, would, would, would I rather it be with fans and, and at the home parks? Of course, absolutely. But I think we got to look at our alternative, which is what we're at right now, which is no – Major League Baseball at all, um, you know, may you know. I think if you even if you started out with this plan, you could maybe adjust that as you went along, depending on how it works. And um, you know, maybe you could get get teams in their home parks for for the playoffs once that time comes. Um, you know, if we're in a better situation. But but yeah, I, I'm I'm all for it, man. Anything to get the games on TV again. Obviously, now I, I think from an atmosphere standpoint, it would be very very weird. Um, it would be kind of interesting, at least for a while, um, to hear the players uh, because you. I, I think with a game like baseball and, and really any sport, a, a lot of times the, the guys are sort of drowned out by, by everything else going on. But I think it would be a really unique situation for for Major League Baseball to, to maybe give us a little more insight into what the players are actually saying on the field. That, that's something they've experimented with both in the All-Star game where they've mic'd guys up, and even in spring training this year, you know, they were doing full-on live interviews with guys while they were in the field, mm-hmm. which I, I think uh, you're, you're sort of old-school, um, you know, guys who are stuck in the past. Frankly, baseball guys, that, that bothers them a, a little bit. But 
I think it's really good for moving the game forward. You're not going to be doing full-on interviews with the center fielder in the middle of a real baseball game, but just naturally with no with nobody drowning everything out, you know, no fans drowning everything out, you're going to get a little bit more of a unique um, view and, I guess, audio of the game because you're going to actually be able to hear all the communication from guys. And if, I, if I'm ESPN or, or Fox Sports or whoever and I have the rights to these games, I'm going to kind of lean into that and, and maybe put more mics around the, uh, the playing field and actually – if you can't have the experience of, of the fans, at least maybe um, accentuate some of the positives that would maybe come from what is otherwise a negative. I think it would be fantastic. And, and Chris, whenever the NFL has their mic'd up segments, I always think it's interesting, but it leaves a lot to be desired. It's like, oh, it's cool when you can hear people, you know, sort of making adjustments, you know, telling a guy to, to you know, he's got to go there. You got to get this guy. And obviously they limit what they can broadcast because you don't want to be giving away too many company secrets, as it were. But I always want more of that stuff. And, and whenever you're you know, at a basketball game, you, say, you, you, know, you go to a Carolina basketball game, and, I mean, you can hear Frank Martin anywhere, but when you can hear you know, some of the players talking if you're sitting close enough to the court and things like that, I, I love that stuff. Now, the tricky part about putting that on TV you know, for the NBA or for you know, Major League Baseball, I guess, specifically, you're going to hear a lot of things that, uh, that are not going to be family-friendly. <laughs> you know, when, when you're talking about NBA players, you know, getting dunked on and grabbing rebounds and, you know, getting hit with hard screens and stuff like that. Um, I don't know, like, a, a real workaround for that, but I, I wonder if the benefit of, like Wes is talking about, the added experience of, like, you know, just hearing guys, you know, call out screens and call out plays and just, you know, talk on defense and talk on offense and, and do all that kind of stuff. I wonder if those benefits would outweigh the potential negative of, you know, hearing an F-bomb every five seconds. Probably so. I mean, you'd people would just have to understand in that situation that what you might hear. But I think people would like to hear stuff like that for the most part. You know, um, I don't know if you have, could you, at least while, while sports are limited, do you, do you have a, a last dance S type where you have to have an edited version on, yeah. on one station and, and the explicit version on the other one? I don't, I don't know. But uh, no, I, I'm all for that type of like insight into the game. Um, as long as you do it right, like I don't like like in game action and stuff like that is cool. I never really like the maybe this is just me, but the like third inning dugout interviews that they do like in college baseball. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just I think a lot of times those are just sort of useless for me. Yeah, um, I agree. Or, or even like the the halftime like interview with the coach. Sometimes they're good. It depends on who you get. And I understand why they do them, but sometimes coaches are like, we have to play better, and then that's it. Yeah, well, you know, we just need to go out there and not, execute, and we compelling. let them you know, get a few too many big right. plays, and we need to get a few more big plays and score some more points, and we'll try to do that in the second half. Yeah, that, and that's normally what you get, and I understand. But, and sometimes you get some gold, so you, you do it on the chance that you get something good. But I think the in-game stuff is a lot better, like mm-hmm. heat of the moment type of stuff is, is pretty neat. All right, now, Chris, what about specifically, like, playing in Disney World? I, I've mentioned that to a couple people, and most people have been like, cool, yeah, bring it back, bring back basketball, but I've mentioned it to at least one person that was like, that's not fair. Why do they get to go to Disney World? <laughs> well, we, you know, we got this email this morning from, like, a travel agent. We've been looking at taking a trip to Disney, and there's a travel agent that apparently thinks that Disney itself, this is a side note, obviously, is going to reopen, like, this summer. I've heard that it's not opening for quite a while. So anyway, we'll see. And that adds another like dynamic to that. But um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm good with it. Like I understand why the baseball players, wh- where were they trying to take them to? I don't know, North Dakota or Wyoming or something and trying to hold them up there. And they're like, no, we're going to be away from our families for, you know, way out there and, and all that while, while sports are shut down. But um, no, I, I think that would be a, a good thing. I mean, it'd be like, what is it, the wide, wide world of sports? Yeah, whatever. that's exactly what they're going to be doing. And, you know, that, obviously <laughs> yeah, ESPN yeah. is the primary broadcast partner for the NBA, and there's already, you know, the infrastructure there to broadcast stuff because they have these huge arenas where they're used to broadcasting events. So I think it's fantastic. And, and again, like the, the, both of the, you know, both sides of it, it's an easy place to quarantine players and families and to, you know, have tests and then to make sure that everybody is limiting their contact with the outside world more than somewhere like Las Vegas or Los Angeles where the NBA, I think, was originally – thinking about trying to come back and trying to fit, you know, all the, the entire team. And again, the other side of it, Wes, where you're, 
giving Disney the opportunity to not exactly open Disney World back up, but to bring back some of those jobs because as much as we talk about sports, you know, I think the three of us have all tried to do our part in terms of supporting local businesses and encouraging people to support local businesses because it's a really, really tough time economically. And if we can't get completely back to normal, we need to, I think, as much as possible, be doing what we can to continue to support those things. And if, like I said, this means Disney having the opportunity to bring back you know, a couple hundred, maybe even a couple thousand jobs in terms of maintaining infrastructure with custodial staff and with restaurant staff and with host- hotel staff and things like that that would be required to host the NBA at Disney World, I, I think that's another really encouraging sign. Yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, to, to tie all that together, um, I, I think you could have live mics throughout the um, throughout the game. And, and if you do have one of those F-bombs you were talking about, that's, that's one more job for somebody who's, yeah. you know, you could just have this thing on like a 10 second delay mm-hmm. and um, just at any time something, you know, just have a, I guess a list of words that can't go over the air. And you got a guy who's going to sort of mute the audio, um, you know, whenever, whenever those things happen. So that's one more job per game uh, that you could give somebody. So, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm all for it, man. I, I mean, obviously, I, I mean, these, from a league standpoint, these players make all you know all this money, and, and then it provides so many jobs for, for different staffers and stuff. But if you don't have games, obviously you, you don't have that, that those revenues coming in to, to turn around and, and pay people. And like you said, it's not just the millionaire um, baseball players. It's so many just regular people like you and I who um, you know basically make their living off of this stuff. And some of that still wouldn't come back, obviously. Your, your local people in, in all these towns – um, that work at the stadiums and stuff are still hurting, I'm sure. But um, I know I know baseball. A lot of teams have like made steps to to pay those guys anyway. But but eventually, um, <clears throat> you know, and I think this goes back to the greater conversation going on right now. Eventually, you have to find a way to get that money back coming in. You know, it's not a limitless supply uh, of money. So um, if you're Major League Baseball. And from what I've read, this is what they've done. You, you've got to look at every single option, every mm-hmm. any option that can get you back and get you back somewhat safely. Um, you, you got to look into. And I, I'm I, I'm very curious to see how how these things move forward and, and who's the first uh, you know sort of uh, group to get back. Who's the first league to get back with fans? What what are the stipulations? Are uh, does every fan have to sign a waiver? Um, do you bring fans back, but you have, you know, three three seats between everybody or, or something, and you start out trying? I don't know if you can social distance the stadium though. It, it seems um, kind of impossible. Do, do you bring fans back at some point, but require masks, which I, I think is something that that we may see at, at some point, especially early on in, in bringing fans back. So th- there's so many questions that all these leagues, I, I think are going to have to answer pretty soon, frankly. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I, for one, you know, I'm a huge NBA fan, so I would support it coming back, and I feel like it would be doubly awesome again for it to be in Disney World for all the reasons. And maybe, you know, you just replace all the mascots with, like, Disney mascots, so you bring back a few more jobs of, you know, Disney mascots or something like that. Or um, I don't know. I just think that's a, a really cool and creative solution. And that's been one of the fun parts, maybe the only fun, well, not the only fun part of quarantine, but one of the few fun parts of quarantine is to see, how people are entertaining themselves and how people are, you know, getting creative. And it's, you know, the, the, the classic, uh, what is it? Invention is born out of necessity kind of thing where, where people to, to figure out how to live their lives and how to, you know, work and, you know, maintain these kinds of things have had to get creative. And I, I love that major league baseball and the NBA are, are doing that. And it looks like college football may have to do that as well. Um, now hopefully they won't, hopefully things will be back to normal by then to the point where college football doesn't have to get too creative. But, um, I, I don't know. This is this is like really outside of the the realm of what we normally do in this podcast. But it's just um, it, it's been a long time, and as things start to open back up, I just kind of wanted to get y'all's thoughts on that and and kind of how how it's going for you and and some of the options that are out there to get some of the other sports that are planning on coming back or hoping to come back sooner rather than later. Um, so anyway, that's uh, well, hey, how how surreal would it be though if you know fans are back in the stands and, and you're watching a game on TV, but literally every single person in the crowd has a mask on. Like how, how, how just weird of an image would that be? That, would it be weirder yeah, to see we that or see a, a world series game with no one in the stands? I, I, I don't, I don't know. I think it would probably be, 
it would be equally surreal, but I think it would sort of just um, – it would almost be a, like an image of the times that, mm-hmm. okay, that sports are so important to us that we're – you know we're we're still playing the games in the middle of a pandemic mm-hmm. but that um because of where things are in the world right now everybody had to wear a mask yeah like that that would just be like such a surreal image like i, I think no fans in the stands would be weird but it would it would just sort of feel like oh they're broadcasting a scrimmage or something is kind of what it would feel like yeah that's but, true. Uh, but like when you put TV, that game on ESPN classic if that channel still exists it's like oh i know exactly when that game was played yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, can you imagine though? Every and, and I would imagine the fans would would get masks with their with their team logo on it or something. Ooh. So I just, I just, I think that would be that that would just be a crazy image. And I, I mean, if, if and it depends on the research, but it seems like more and more research says you know initially they told us masks didn't really help a whole lot, but the, the most recent research I guess says if especially if both parties as in someone who was potentially infected and someone that they could potentially pass it to if both mm-hmm. parties are wearing a mask. Um, supposedly that cuts down the rate of infection by a huge percentage. So yeah. I'm just wondering if, if maybe that's a part of bringing everybody back is that you require everybody to wear a mask, which is what some stores and grocery stores are, are already doing, um, just how how strange of an image that would be. Yeah, it's like, Kind of Mad Maxi. Uh, also, the the team specific mask is a great idea. So, uh, Wes, if you uh, if you get a phone call from like a front office from an MLB or NBA team trying to hire you to do some marketing for them, don't be surprised. Um, last thing before we get into a little bit of football news, because um, again, that's that's mostly what we do around here, and this is a, a I don't know, hopefully a welcome detour. I, I feel like it's uh, it's been good for the three of us. I, you know, I've enjoyed hearing your perspective on it as well. So, uh, you know, I hope you all listening have enjoyed that as well, even though it's a little bit different than what we normally do. But uh, last thing that's a little bit different, uh, Chris, what is your head and facial hair situation? <laughs> I guess we'll find out on the next Zoom call uh, that, that Wes and I do. Um, the, uh, the hair, I was just thinking yesterday, it's, it's not, certainly not at its longest it's been during quarantine. It's not yet out of control. It's getting a little longish. Mm. Facial hair. So do you cut it or does your wife um, probably cut Probably in the next two days. My wife has cut it twice. Oh, nice. Um, and she's, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I thought about I, – I gave a little bit of consideration. Should I just buzz it, you know, like, all off? Because that's how oh, I did it. No. Like, in college, in college when I had the super long hair, um, I went from one extreme to the other. I just buzzed it all the way off one night. And so I went from super long hair to, like, no hair, and it was mm. bizarre. <laughs> But uh, I haven't gone that route. Um, the, the facial hair is just sort of normal, and the hair is just sort of normal for me right now, which is relatively long but not too out of control. Okay. All right. That's that's not that exciting, but that's fine. That's fine. You're, you're doing a better job of the rest Sorry. of us uh, of grooming, so I guess that's I guess that's good. Uh, Wes, you are not married, so you don't have a, a, a wife to cut your hair. So are you cutting your own? Do you have a friend that can cut it, or are you just going wild man like me? Uh, well, no, Mackenzie, uh, the girlfriend has, has been cutting it for me. Um, she was actually quite excited for that opportunity. I don't know why, because I initially told her that there was no way that I was going to let her cut it, which made her want to cut it even more, I guess, as how that works. But not, so here's the struggle for me, man. The, the side part is like pretty easy, um, to do, but, um, like the, the part on top, which they normally, cut with like scissors when i go get my hair cut um that, that's the part that i'm sort of struggling with right now so right now the, the top has just gotten very very thick and mm-hmm. long and it, it needs to be trimmed again um I, I told my girlfriend that uh that aiden who normally cuts my hair that her job security has never been better as far as i'm concerned <laughs> that i can't wait to go back and get <laughs> a uh an actual haircut um because i'm I'm actually one of those guys that's a little bit particular about my haircut, so I, I go to the same person. Yeah. She cuts it exactly the same. Like I, I like, I like having a fresh haircut, honestly. So, um, yeah. So I, I'll be looking forward to to that day again. But I, I definitely need to cut it again, man. It's just it's gotten so thick and heavy on on top. I feel that. I feel that. Now I've gone the other way. I'm fully embracing it. Um, neither of you have ever seen my hair this long. It's long as has been at least since college, 
maybe since high school, and my beard is completely unwieldy, and I'm not trimming it. I'm not going to touch it because I want a really epic before and after picture. Um, I didn't like take a picture the first day of quarantine because I didn't exactly know when that is, and I still don't know what that is, but I have pictures from around that time, um, and then obviously I'm going to have one at the end, and it's going to look ridiculous, and I, I think you all probably get a kick out of it. But I, I'm like you, Wes. You know, part of it is, again, wanting the before and after picture and just wanting an excuse to just look like a – caveman i guess uh but i'm also really particular about my haircut my girlfriend said she wouldn't do it anyway because she's scared that she would mess it up um and doesn't trust herself to cut curly hair but also first 23 or four years of my life i went to the same person and her name was kelly and she owned hair doodles and so you know it was fine when i was going there as a kid and then it got to the point where it was like me and then all the other clientele was like you know three and four year olds um, a lot of little <laughs> girls. Um, <laughs> so it was kind of mixed clientele, but I was like, look, Kelly, I mean, you've been cutting my hair my whole life. I don't trust anybody else to do it. So I'm just going to keep coming to you. And I would, you know, even when I was in college, I would, you know, just come back for a weekend and, or, you know, like end of the week or something to get my hair cut. Uh, but a couple of years ago, she had a baby, went on maternity leave. And I was like, all right, well, I need a haircut at some point in the next, you know, four or six months, whatever. So I went to Wa over at Kings Row, which is who's been cutting my dad's hair for a while. And I was like, oh no. I'm, I, <laughs> and then I switched. I, I, you know, I'm not going to say anything bad about Kelly because she's amazing and she cut my hair for my entire life. But I went to Wa and I was like, oh man, I, I I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to Wa. And um, so yeah, I've been going there ever since. But all that to say, only two people have ever cut my hair my entire life. So I completely understand where you're coming from, Wes. Yeah, and I um, th- this isn't the person that cut my hair when I was a kid, but just as the actual friend of a friend that. I discovered does a really good job and um what but what I feel like once you uh once you get a haircut that you just feel like fits you mm-hmm. it's like okay I, I just, I'm just gonna stick with this obviously there, there's no need for the rest of my life to change the way my hair is cut like it, it can be exactly the same until the day I die and I'll be happy with that but dude so you, are you telling us that you have not cut your hair or shaved <laughs> at all no, let's see. Story? The last time I shaved, um, I'm just gonna go back in my pictures. Oh. See what? So, so you have shaved during this? No, no, no. I mean, the, the last time I shaved, I'm looking here. Uh, end of February, so a, February 22nd, maybe. Of when you shaved? No, no, no. I'm um, just, I'm, I'm going back. I'm in my phone right now. I'm just looking <laughs> at pictures. I'm trying to see of like the last time that I had a a picture of myself that looked relatively clean shaven, and it looks like. Maybe, uh, oh gosh, I don't, I don't take very many pictures of myself, so this is actually kind of hard to find. But like end of February, beginning of March, so it's been about two full months, and you know it, it's kind of a blessing and a curse. I have a very thick mustache, and it, you know it, it helps you know hold the whole beard together, which is great. It allows me to have full facial hair, but when I don't trim it, which again I, I'm not going to touch it because I want it to, I want it to be a true sign of the times like you were talking about with the masks i want to be able to see a picture of myself from like right now and know exactly why i looked the way i look right now and it's it's getting like super andy reed where it's like hanging over my mouth and whenever i drink water like it gets in my mustache and trickles down the side and spills on my shirt um so i mean it's uh it, it's it's getting kind of gross but i'm uh, i'm not doing it and, it and by the way it looks like uh maybe march 7th or somewhere around then was the last time i shaved so just about two full months and yeah i haven't cut my hair since Middle of February, beginning of February. Y'all have never seen wow. my hair or my beard this long. Wow. Now, I was about to give you about crap that. for uh, for how many pictures of yourself you have in your phone and how often you take pictures of yourself, but you said there's not many. So no, yeah, there were only, I like, I can only find, like, three that. or four. Okay. Yeah, and there were, like, pictures of me with somebody else. That's so not, you don't have, like, a selfie from every day or anything? <laughs> no, although I think it's really cool when people do that, like, with their with their children – um, where it's like, I took a picture of my son every day from day one to, you know, his fifth birthday and then like time lapse it together really quick. And you can see that it's, that's, that stuff is so yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I would ever like, cool. have the patience or like, like memory to, to remember to do that every single day. Um, I'd forget some days and maybe they did too, but I, I don't think I'd have the dedication to do that, but I think it's really cool. When people do that. Yeah, as long as you're doing it for your kid and not like of yourself. Yeah, Un- unless maybe like maybe it's worth doing if you're uh, like if you're really overweight and you're losing weight and you need to do it to like keep track of like your progress uh, since it's hard to see incremental yeah. progress in yourself. Um, I actually did that for a while when I was losing my college weight. I 
would kind of keep track because I was like, I'm not going to be able to notice the difference. I need to make sure that I know exactly where I started so that I can give myself credit when I've, uh, you know, reached somewhere where I've, uh, I'm satisfied. Um, all right, we're completely off the rails. Uh, y'all are clean shaven. I look like, um, like I said, like a caveman. Whenever we get out of quarantine, and I don't know if there's going to be like a, okay, quarantine is over today, but at some point I will, uh, I'll take a picture. I'll put it on Twitter so y'all will have that to look forward to because I imagine you'll see that before uh, you see me again because if we see each other again, it'll be because quarantine's over. Uh, I am really looking forward to that, but I'm really glad that we've been able to to maintain this because uh, there has been plenty of things going on. Again, NFL has been a lot of South Carolina football news with staff changes and things like that and, and plenty of recruiting news, which is where we go next. Uh, last Thursday, I think it was, so right after we recorded last week's ACP. Haven't had a chance to talk about it yet. South Carolina got another commit, a four-star linebacker this time, Trinilius Tatum. Uh, he's an inside linebacker, 6'2", just over 200 from Jonesboro, Georgia. Uh, Wes, Chris, I don't know which one of you did the official write-up or following of his recruitment or whatever, but which one, whichever one of you wants to start with this, start with this. Yeah, I'll hop in. Um, so another nice pickup as two straight linebackers for South Carolina, two straight linebacker commits. Uh, a little bit different as far as skill sets. You look at Bryce Still, I guess that's, I don't know, it all runs together two or three weeks ago. Bryce, definitely more of your sort of DB who's grown into a linebacker size guy, more of a coverage type linebacker, someone that, you know, I think is more of like a will, you know, maybe in the past would have even been like a spur type type guy positionally at, at South Carolina, at least potentially depending on how big he gets. You look at Trenilius, much more of like an inside the box linebacker, someone that's uh, going to be a more, I guess, comfortable against the run, blitzes a lot. As Chris has pointed out, he, he plays against a lot of teams in their conference that are, are sort of run-based teams. You look at his film, you see a lot of triple option. You see a lot of, you know, sort of compressed formations versus seeing, you know, these, these guys that play against the spread all the time. So a little bit different skill set, but I, I think a, a true linebacker-sized kid, someone that really I, I think is still just sort of learning just how good he, he can be. He's kind of burst onto the scene. I would say last, um, I think it was October, September, somewhere around there. And actually, uh, Chad Simmons, who, who covers Georgia for Rivals.com, you know, is a guy that gets around and sees as many prospects as, as anybody in the country, I think. And he was actually at a game watching Stevenson High, which is, for those who don't know, a, a program that just puts out FBS after FBS kid. And, you know, he was there really to, to watch five or six guys on that team and just pregame saw this kid, uh, you know, on, on the other sideline and was like, dang, he, you know, that kid looks the part. Ends up watching, uh, you know, sort of paying attention to him. He has uh, 12, 13 tackles in the game, two sacks, and, and really was the, the best player on the field. And, and from that point forward, really his recruitment has taken off. Um, you know, I think Georgia Tech maybe saw some of, some of what Chad wrote and, and offered him like that same week. They've been all over him. He picked up, I think it was like 12 offers in December. Really just saw his recruitment take off. But visited Carolina, I guess that was maybe February. Um, it, basically, when, when junior days and, and spring practices were going on, before everything got shut down, he got in right before the shutdown, ha- had just a great visit. And I, I think about that time is when South Carolina was able to sort of pass Georgia Tech, which was sort of, the strongest, the longest there before that. So, yeah, I think a really, really nice pickup for South Carolina. The linebacking group so far with those two guys, um, one of the stronger linebacking classes I think South Carolina's had since Muschamp arrived. And uh, I think he's someone they can really be excited about. And, and, you know, to tie all this into what we've been talking about with the pandemic and everything, guys, I think just as another example, a lot of recruiting success right now, I feel like – has involved a little bit of luck and, and a little bit of um, just did, did you get a kid in to your school? Did you get him on campus before things got shut down or not? And, and if you did, if you're a school, you know, that um, that you're, you're recruiting a guy and you got him on your campus, you you want him to go ahead and, and commit. Mm-hmm. If, uh, if there's a kid that likes you and wants to see your campus but hasn't gotten on campus yet, you want them to wait to commit. So um, as with anything, um, you don't really like to think of a global pandemic in terms of recruiting, but but 
these, from a business standpoint, that that's what's going on here. It's, it's had a very real effect on recruiting and, um, and sort of where these different kids are committing. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you that and kind of zoom out and look at the class because it, it's shaping up to be a, you know, at least a good start to the uh, 2021 class that Will Muschamp and South Carolina is putting together. But I guess before we zoom all the way out, you mentioned that this is already South Carolina's second linebacker this class. And Chris, you and Wes and I have talked a lot on this podcast just about how the linebacker position has changed through the years. There aren't as many on the field, and what is required of linebackers is different than it used to be. I don't know how many teams have a Jasper Brinkley on their roster, but it seems like linebackers are all going to start looking a little bo- a little bit more like Mo Caba, where you're a little longer, you're a little rangier, you're good in coverage, you can do a little pass rush. Not as much, uh, I guess, emphasis put on necessarily stopping the run. Um, and I guess, you know, Trillian's Tatum doesn't exactly fit that. He's, you know, I guess a little bit taller at 6'2". Um, I don't know in terms of, you know, his physicality, his style of play, anything like that. So uh, you, you can speak to that if you want. But just in general, when you look at this class of linebackers from South Carolina, do you know how many other guys they're going to be looking to get? And, and sort of, like, is this Carolina, is this Carolina like, zagging while other people are zigging? Or is the, they just happen to get two linebackers and then they're probably going to be done for now? No, I think to, to go answer the question by the numbers first, I think ideally – South Carolina would like to take another one in this class. You know, Cabo was sort of the headliner, uh, one of the headliners of the class, really, in terms of what the staff thinks of him last year. They signed, a, obviously, a good class, some guys like Birch and Lloyd. But Cabo is a guy that w- wasn't ranked as highly, but the staff really loved him, loved him early in the process, a big recruiting win for them from the state of North Carolina. And then Gilbert Edmond was a late signing day flip who, you know, on film, he's a, he's a pass rusher who looks like a buck, but he's someone they at least want to give a look inside. It really intriguing skill set, and they'd like to see what he looks like as a Mike or Will backer. Um, and if he doesn't work out there, then you can always go and, and move him to a buck or, or a Sam type position. He has a chance to be a good player there too, you know, converted wide receiver. So it gives you an idea of the type of athleticism and body type. But this year, you know, to pair with Steele and Tatum, they'd probably like to take another one. I mean, another player they've, they've had some traction with recently is another North Carolina product, Jordan Poole. Um, you know, a guy that Des Kitchings has taken over his recruiting territory um, in the state of North Carolina since he arrived on staff. And um, has been talking with Will Muschamp a lot lately, and Kyle Krantz is involved there. So um, they had him in camp last summer. He's, he's maybe a little bit more similar to Steele than Tatum just in terms of his body type. You know, he's put up some good testing numbers in camps at at South Carolina and NC State last summer. Uh, He's a pretty good-looking player. It also plays running back at the high school level. So, you know, it's just interesting when you you make a good point about the linebackers, and Will Muschamp's spoken to this lately. It's linebacker is sort of a – it's sort of a difficult position to evaluate and get really good players nowadays. I mean, when you look at a linebacker now, he has to be able to do so many different things. You still got to be able to come and play in the box and take on offensive linemen who are pulling and, and getting onto the second level and getting on you. You have to be able to get off blocks. You have to be able to turn and run with a tight end or a running back in coverage. You have to be able to zone drop. You have to be able to keep your eyes on very mobile quarterbacks a lot of times. So, that's why it's gone a lot towards, you know, sometimes hybrid type players or uh, certainly athleticism across the board in college football. If you looked at a linebacker nowadays versus 30 years ago, I mean, guys are going to be more athletic, and that's the case at many positions, mm-hmm. you know, not all of them. Offensive linemen are bigger, stronger, faster, same with D linemen, for example. So um, it, it's just one where you, you look even, you think about Georgia. I mean, Roquan Smith, he wasn't a big guy, you know but he could really run. Uh, he was physical, um, you know, and, and he was an NFL, high NFL draft pick. He was a highly rated guy. Um, you know, N'Kobe Dean, you know, who was a, who was a five-star or a high four-star on certain platforms. Um, he, you know, was another guy that Georgia signed that's in that sort of mold of a Roquan Smith. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so, you, you, you know, Sky Moore. I was going to say, even, even like Sky Moore, like guy. someone that was yeah. a middle linebacker but not – doesn't doesn't like fit yeah. the physical build of a traditional middle linebacker, and, and sort of because of that, hasn't really found a sticking spot in the NFL. Despite the fact that he was probably the best linebacker South Carolina had in a decade, and maybe this century, you could argue. Yeah, and I mean, you, you Sky Moore was excellent in coverage. Obviously, you look at the fact that he's tied for the school lead record all time interceptions with a 
that's a list that has defensive backs on it, you know, and he, he's on that list. But he's also a guy that despite not being 6'4", 250, you know, he was physical and instinctive enough to where he could go make an open field tackle on Todd Gurley, you know. And that's not an easy thing. I mean, go back and ask any South Carolina football player, you know, a while back I sort of polled a bunch of them, who's the best player you ever played against. And if any of them played against Todd Gurley, he was at least one of their answers, yeah. if not the answer. So, um, you know, it's just it's guys like that. You, you just have to have such a unique skill set. So if you can find a guy who can do all those things, he's going to be a hot commodity in recruiting. And um, you just have to be able to find a unique skill set. So if we zoom out then a little bit more, and you already touched on this, and I think this is a really interesting point you made, Wes, just about you know the quarantine for the schools that already had guys on campus. You know they're able to take advantage of it because, as I mentioned, you know Trinelli Tatum, four star guy. You add that to Colton Gothier, who's also four stars. You know a guy in Bryce Steele that it sounds like both of y'all think you know has a good chance by the end of next season to also be four stars. So you're talking about basically half your class, that, you know six guys right now, um, and obviously. There's there's a long way to go, and you're you're going to fill that up. There's you know 23 or however many spots available in this class, so a, a long way to go before we put the finishing touches and, and the final notes on this. But it's a it's an auspicious start for South Carolina. And I've asked you guys, you know, just kind of sarcastically and, and rudely and, and a little bit tongue in cheek, you know, how does Carolina keep getting these good guys after they just went four and eight? And there's so much or so little stability within the program. Uh, and, and Wes, I, I think again to your point, the quarantine may be helping South Carolina. But zoom out. Like, what is how is Will Muschamp still selling these guys on, on the future of a program that is like even uncertain for him and for his staff? Well, I think um, as with anything, if you're if you're recruiting guys for your program, you, you have to point to you know to the positives. And I think a big part of that is that a you're, you're talking about some of the nicest facilities in the country. Uh, some of the newest facilities in the country. Uh, you have a coaching staff that uh, is loaded up with, with assistants that have recruited well in the past and have and know what it takes to sign players. And, and you have a head coach, frankly, that um, kids love to play for. I mean, that that's never been the issue there. I, I think, obviously, um, you know, you if you're South Carolina, you have to go find kids that can see past the record from this past season. And if it's a kid – I think early on, if you find out a kid is just uh, just looking to play for for a big logo, is the way we always frame it. Um, you know, you, you're probably not going to get that guy. Now, there are times where South Carolina. I mean, you look you look at the case of Jordan Birch. I mean, South Carolina beat what LSU, uh, Georgia, Alabama, and Clemson. Um, you know, four of the hottest programs in the country to, to land Jordan Birch. But for the most part, if you're going going up against a group that's all sort of logo schools or or teams that that are just hot right now, it's going to be tough. So I think if you're South Carolina, you got to find the right kids. You got to sell sell past the record. You got to sell them that you know you're you're a few guys away from from taking another step forward. And um, and again, you know Will Muschamp's a likable guy. He's got likable staffers um, underneath him, and I think that that's a big part of it. And you know for for them, you know I don't know necessarily that that the quarantine and everything has helped South Carolina, I think you can probably find just as many guys that it's hurt them with because they weren't able to get them on campus. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you look at Travion Cooley, he's a running back out of North Carolina. I, I think South Carolina would probably um, already have potentially had him committed if, um, you know, if they could have gotten him on campus. Uh, you know, you look at Lavasia Carroll, the, the four-star running back that's now committed to Georgia. I think, South Carolina was probably going to miss on him anyway, but he was scheduled for an official visit to South Carolina on the day of the spring game or the weekend of the spring game, was never able to take that trip, obviously, because everything got shut down. So I think everybody's dealing with it right now. I don't know necessarily that it's helping one school uh, uh, you know, more than any other. I, I just think for specific recruitments, if you if you got the kid in for a junior day or a spring practice, that gives you a little bit of a leg up. If you didn't and other schools did, then you're fighting an uphill battle. And really you, you just have to, you have to hope that the, the kid wants to wait until things are back active again, because, you know, no, no, to me, no kid, I, I mean, I wouldn't advise a kid to commit somewhere if he's never stepped foot on the campus. It does happen from time to time, but that wouldn't be my advice if it was a kid who was asking me. So 
Uh, now, the, the other side of this, guys, is you're going to have kids commit that really haven't taken visits and maybe commit to other schools, and then they're all going to turn around and take – I would say you're going to have more committed prospects <laughs> taking visits to other schools this fall, assuming that everything's back on, than probably you do in a normal year just because of how things have played out. That's true, too. Uh, but the one thing that I wonder now, and we talked about this a little bit with Marshawn Lloyd's commitment. I think maybe you made the point, Chris, or you did Wes, but I'll, I'll ask you, Chris, because what I thought was interesting, the way that y'all put it, Thomas Brown was the guy that got Marshawn Lloyd in the door, or got South Carolina in the door with Marshawn Lloyd, but ultimately it was selling the vision of South Carolina that's that, that helped Lloyd stay committed. You know, when South Carolina finished 4-8, and eight, there was a lot of you know, conversation, and I think rightfully so. Okay, how many guys is Carolina going to lose? Well, actually, none. And also, they're going to you know finish off what's been a you know nip tuck recruitment for Jordan Birch with the other best school or the best schools in the country. But it's something about having sold the vision of South Carolina that seemed to convince those players to stay aboard more than even necessarily you know, the program or, or even that coaching staff. It feels like so. When you look ahead to this college football season, which, again, it might happen, it might not, it might be short, it might be normal. We have no idea what it's going to look like. But if at the end of the day, whatever South Carolina does in a 12-game schedule, in an 8-game schedule, in a 6-game schedule, is unsatisfactory and the staff is gone, does the way that Will Muschamp sells these recruits and, and his assistants sell these recruits, does it does it make it maybe more likely that the guys are going to stick around because they've just been sold on South Carolina as opposed to a specific vision of, of, of like a program under a staff? Because that was sort of the I, – I never thought about it like that until South Carolina didn't lose anybody from the class of 2020. And you all explained to me that it was sort of because it was it became more about South Carolina, you know, once the players committed. Is that just part of his pitch? Is that unusual uh, for Will Muschamp? Is that unique? And do you think – that should worse come to worse and South Carolina goes four and eight again this year and Will Muschamp's gone, they'll still be able to hang on to some of these guys. Well, that's that's really difficult to answer. I mean, really, when you're, you know, sort of projecting if this happens, because a lot of kids are going to take it case by case. You know, what what's the climate? What what op- other options do they have? It's tough to tell. I mean, re- recruiting is very very relationship driven, right? And so a coach who's a good recruiter is going to go- do a good job of being able to point out the positives about South about a place like South Carolina, just the place, the education, the location, the SEC, you know, affiliation, all those things, plus the coaching staff. And by that, I mean the relationships there, the bonds that are built, the, uh, the, the track record of development of those certain coaches, just different things that you can point to. And so, you know, when you, when you look at the, <laughs> the 2020 class to go back to that for a second, I mean, yeah, there were a lot of things that, you know, Marshawn Lloyd, for example, could look at, at the situation and see, hey, I can step into this running back room. And he really liked, you know, South Carolina, too. Now, the coaching staff, Thomas Brown specifically, was instrumental in getting him to South Carolina. But there's a reason that he, you know, stuck with it. He's, he's still here. You know, for example, uh, you know, some kids might just say, oh, my coach left. I'm going to look at options. That wouldn't be very smart, you know, but some may do it. Um so I think it's you know they had to they had to do a lot of damage control obviously and one of the one of the parts of it was showing people that hey we had a bad year we'll have a chance to turn it around we will turn it around and sort of project some type of stability and that certainly helped if 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 prospects became utterly convinced that Muschamp was going to get you know fired after last season or imminently after this season they wouldn't have had as good a chance so that is part of the the job of recruiting but you have to show them all the different things so I mean in this class it, it's tough to tell I mean w- with there are going to be certain kids in a class like a Jordan Birch for example without Will Muschamp South Carolina wouldn't have had a prayer in my opinion with Jordan Birch I mean he, he was the primary reason now it helped that South Carolina was so close for example that certainly helped but even given that, I don't think South Carolina wins, you know, Jordan Birch without Will Muschamp. Um, you know, you, there's a, maybe a couple other coaches that you could put in that chair that, that might have been able to land at them, but probably not many, okay? And and he was the X factor there. So I think, you know, again, case-by-case case basis, when you're projecting something that far out that we have really have no idea what what will happen, um, I do think anytime there's a coaching change anywhere, 
Um, and in this situation, it, it would probably, we don't even know what the class is going to look like. There's only, what, six guys in the class. Mm -hmm. I think it would have an effect on this class in terms of some guys at least looking around. But that's, again, just sort of a projection. Yeah, a lot of unusual circumstances, and I guess like everything, especially yeah. in recruiting, it's a case by case basis. You know, maybe playing time was more a factor for Lloyd than even anything specific to South Carolina. Although there does seem to be some element of you know him him being intrigued by the opportunity to really create a legacy mm -hmm. here that you, that you can't at a lot of other SEC schools because frankly there are a lot of other legacies in place and a lot more history than here at South Carolina. It's just I I don't know. It continues to intrigue me and. It's like the more time I spend on recruiting, and again, I don't follow it. I just kind of lean on you guys. But e even just doing this podcast every week, it's like the the more time I spend with recruiting, the less I understand about it. No, I mean it, it's a it's a, a beast. You know, it's a, it's just there's a lot of layers, a lot of complexities to it. Um, you know, a time like right now. You know, I, I think we all wondered, are, are kids going to hold off on their decisions? Are they going to accelerate their decisions? And again, and I think people almost get irritated when we say this, but it, it just depends. It's hard to predict. And one thing we said when we were talking about that a few weeks ago is we would just have to see. And what we're seeing is that some guys have decided, hey, this is affecting my timeline. I needed to go out and take some more visits. I haven't been able to do that, so now I have to push things back. We've seen some other guys go the opposite direction, say, I'm going to go ahead and whatever it may be, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and grab my spot. I'm going to go ahead and commit. I think it's going to be interesting because I feel like some of these commitments that are happening over the summer, and I don't mean South Carolina necessarily, because a lot of the guys they've gotten have been on firm ground that they visited. They've even visited this year right before the shutdown. They visited multiple times. But just a, as a general point, some of these guys jumping in with commitments I think we're going to see continue to look around, you know, once the season reopens, because that would happen anyway. A lot of commitments happen now, get nowadays, and guys go and look around. But um, I don't think that's going to be any different. But yeah. it's just it's changed a lot, Pearson, since Wes and I even started covering it. It's just a lot different nowadays with the the oversaturation of media and how much the media and social media, you know, plays into the whole process. I, I've just always I've always bought Will Muschamp as a recruiter. Um, I mean, it's hard not to because, I mean, his track record speaks for itself. What, Javon Kinlaw was his 18th or 19th first-round pick, and, I mean, that, that's basically one a year. He's been coaching for about 20 years, so that's a a pretty sterling track record, and it's it's hard to argue with that. But And, and obviously there are other things, you know, game management and game decisions, different things that have obviously led to South Carolina being mostly disappointing uh, with the exception of that one nine-win year that feels more like a fluke than anything else at this point. But when you're putting guys into the NFL, I mean, even last year's team, you have four guys drafted and you go four and eight. Like that's that's better. I, I looked at every other Power Five school that was four and eight or worse. South Carolina put the most players in the NFL draft. Nobody else had four. There were you know a couple with two, one with three, mostly zero or one. So the talent is there, and and we're not necessarily here in the off season to kind of relitigate everything that happens or happened, you know, during last season or is going to happen in future seasons. But it, it again just feels like oh, you got some talent. You know, the class of 2020 is good and good start to the class of 2021 so it's like if you can survive the 2020 football season you've got a lot of talent but it's like we kind of said that after the class of 2018 and the class of 2019 and, and west like you reach a point where it's it's just got to be development and, and and putting it together on the field but this this is like this is kind of the cycle of will Muschamp. it's like get excited about the recruits recognize that there's talent those guys go on to the nfl and then in the meantime whether it's at florida whether it's in south carolina it's just like mostly disappointment in between and i and i don't know what to make of it because i, I feel I feel like I should not be getting excited about the class of 2020 and a good early start to the class of 2021 because there doesn't seem to necessarily be the same, uh, I guess, like one-to-one -one return on good players and subsequently good football team. Well, I, I think if you uh, – I've, I've made this point many times. I think if you're South Carolina, though, you have to continue to get to get more good players. Uh, just have – I think having a Javon Kinlaw and a Brian Edwards – you know, and a DJ Wanham, uh, you know, got TJ Brunson guys that get drafted. Um, you know, the, the problem is a lot of the top teams in the conference have, uh, have a couple of Javon Kinlaws and a couple of Brian Edwards and a couple of DJ Wanhams. And, uh, and that's what you're going up against uh, week in, week out. Now, you know, South Carolina, as we've said, I mean, we're not going to go all back into it. They should never go four and eight. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's been discussed along, you know, for a long time. But, um, I, I think, um, 
you know, the, early on in, in Muschamp's tenure at South Carolina, it's easy to forget that they were actually ahead of schedule a bit and, and winning at a faster pace than um, maybe anyone expected. Now, uh, some of that had to do with the schedule, obviously, but there were, there were games where South Carolina won that, that they were not favored. And then this past year, you face a much, much tougher schedule. Things sort of got out of hand. You have too many injuries, and then you start losing games that really you're you're not supposed to, and, and that's a whole other discussion. Mm-hmm. But I, I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's about continuing to stack talent and then uh, ultimately finding a way to, to turn it around on the field, which, uh, you know, frankly, is uh, it, it's easy to look back at, at last year and, and get uh, down on everything, just like it was easy to look at the first two years and, and think everything was in place to, to sort of take off and, and bigger things are ahead. So uh, that's not always, I guess, an indicator of, of things that are to come. Um, I think it's just uh, – and sometimes it's, it's about old-fashioned luck as well and, and who gets – you know, who which teams remain healthy and, and which teams don't. Yeah, it's just I don't know. Just trying to make sense out of it because it's it, it's it's a weird cycle, an emotional roller coaster for South Carolina fans, I imagine, as well to have you know all these guys and then it's like, oh, what are you doing with them? But um, in any case, that's sort of the, that's the recruiting update for this week. Uh, another linebacker for South Carolina, another four star guy, continuing to stack talent. I, I guess now it's sort of a race against the clock. Can Will Muschamp get enough talent to turn the program around before his underwhelming performances have him leave South Carolina? Um, I feel like that was – I don't want to end it on, like, such a blah note um, in the off season here because we are talking about South Carolina landing another four-star linebacker and, and some other things, but that's, I don't know, kind of where Carolina football is right now. Um, Chris, you want to say something uh, positive so we don't have to end on a <laughs> negative note? Well, no, I, I think when you look at – look, I mean, uh, didn't Mississippi State have, like, five guys drafted, four or five guys? I mean, and they've had – you know, they were just sort of meh last year, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, they they weren't a four win team, but I mean, they look having talent on the team is is certainly a huge part of it. Draftable talent is a good indication that you've landed some players. Who, um, obviously, if you go play pro football, you've landed a really good football player. If you produced a first round pick, you've selected, evaluated, recruited a very good football player, and you've developed him well enough to where. NFL teams feel that he's worth investing millions of dollars in uh, to change their franchise around. So those are all positives, but those are just part of it, right? I mean, it's not, um, you know, your, your entire 22 or all your special teams. Are, it's not accounting for a thing like injuries or coaching. And so certainly there have been some things when you look at, you know, you look at last year, for example, and we don't have to relitigate it, but the, the injuries the past two years have been so significant that it, it's hard for even the most negative person to to not look at it and say, you know what, if South Carolina had maybe a, a full slate or a relatively normal injury situation, how many more games could they have won the past two seasons? Th- there are some out there. I mean, you never convinced me otherwise. Now, should they have won more games regardless? You could also certainly argue that. So then you go back to what are you doing with the offense? Did you need to make a change earlier in the strength and conditioning department? I mean, there there are legitimate things there. Um, but the first two years went well. And so now it's just about, you know, continuing to try to recruit. It's paramount to have a, good, a decent year this year. Um, I, I don't think anybody needs to expect 10 wins. But if you can get back in the win column, get back to a bowl that's going to give you enough stability to go be able to recruit you need to go get a win against a team like tennessee for example maybe steal another one and then and then you need to go and play catch up to the other ones Mm -hmm. um so this year is just so important for for that reason um and there's still a chance they can do that i mean maybe mike bobo can squeeze enough production out of this offense maybe they stay healthy enough to where they're not decimated by the end of the year defensively or like last year on offense, maybe they find enough playmakers. They find a a bit of a running game. You know, if they're, if they can do those things, there is some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of being able to have a good enough year to keep things in place. Then you can go, you know, create some stability in recruiting and then build upon that. The Mm -hmm. first two years they were building and then it sort of went backwards for a variety of reasons. So they got to stop that and get back on the right track. And there's still a chance of that. 
Well, we can all say this. I think we can all agree on this. If you have the option to watch zero South Carolina football games this fall or watch South Carolina go six and six or five and seven or seven and five, and for Carolina fans, at least get to watch, you know, five wins or six wins or seven wins, I think they would take that over no games. So we will all just cross our fingers for that and worry about, I guess, relitigating the football season once uh, the football season is underway and uh, and over. But uh, right now it's the off season, it's talking season, and things are going. I guess surprisingly well for South Carolina, considering the circumstances, everything from the finishing touches on the 2020 class through some promising early stages of the class of 2021. Uh, So Wes and Chris, thank you for your continued hard work on this, on the recruiting beat. I know it's probably, I know y'all work from home, so that part's not unusual to you, but everything else about this is unusual. And, uh, you know, the contact that schools can and can't have with players and that subsequently y'all can and can't have with players surely has, has made this a difficult and unique challenge. So, you know, appreciate all the, Good work that you always do, GamecockCentral.com. And y'all should subscribe to that. And uh, don't y'all have – y'all have something going on on GamecockCentral.com. Yeah, um, free free until August, actually. Mm. Uh, promo code GameCocks2020. Um, it is a free trial, so you, you do have to put in, obviously, your – uh, you know, your credit card information and all that stuff. And, and once the trial is over, it'll kick in like, like a normal subscription. But, but yeah, free from now. And the, the great thing about it is it's free to August. So there's really, if you're, if you're going to do it, there's really no point in, in waiting because I, I think the, the spot that the trial ends is the same for everybody. So you might as well go ahead and, and start getting your free days now, now. And, um, and check it out. So it is, it is Gamecocks20 is the promotional code. If you go to GamecocksCentral.com, look at the very top of the screen where the menu is. There's like a huge just like top border spot that says live and it says free trial for new subscribers. And um, certainly we, we want for our podcast listeners to, uh, you know, convert on over and, and give us a shot on the uh, the web subscription side and you can sort of get a chance to – to read about all the things that we sometimes talk about on the podcast, but, Mm -hmm. but read, you know, read about them in real time and and get the information as it happens. Yeah. The podcast is free, but we only do it once a week. So if you want basically more expansive versions of everything that we talk about and you want the constant update, GamecockCentral.com is where you get all of that. And I mean, for the price that y'all charge for it normally, it's already a steal. And the fact that it's free through the end of August is pretty ridiculous. Um, So if you're not taking advantage of that, then, I don't know what you're doing with your life unless you're listening to this and you're already already a subscriber, in which case you know exactly what I'm talking about. And clearly, look, there's tons of stuff going on. Colin Taylor has been all over it, a lot of fun offseason stuff with South Carolina basketball players. And as recruiting news continues to trickle in for South Carolina, and sooner rather than later, we will have you know some updates about when people can get back onto campus and when spring practice or not spring practice, when like you know fall camp can start and workouts and things like that. So there's going to be a ton of updates. And as always, you know the boards are lively and fun and people having you know historical discussions and all sorts of stuff that's a uh, fun to be a part of on gamecrackcentral.com so go sign up now to be a subscriber for free until yeah. beginning of august and then you know just keep rolling because once football season hits because fingers crossed we'll still have football season as usual uh there's no better place to get all the best information analysis and everything than gamecrackcentral.com um, but again this podcast thank you all so much for listening to it it's free we keep it that way because we love you and we really appreciate you listening and it really helps us if you rate review and subscribe that's all you have to do that's way easier and better than paying so please do that and uh, continue listening to everything on the Gamecock Central Podcast Network, The Hard Foul. If you missed uh, Wilhelms and my wrap-up of the 2020 NFL Draft on Gamecock Central GM, check that out. Uh, The Hard Foul, we had our first episode of The Food Diaries with uh, Colin and Chris just talking about some of their favorite eating stories, which was a lot of fun, some of their favorite places, uh, and and some places they disagreed on as well. So that was a lot of fun. And, of course, ACP rolling every week, and Wes has his quarantine talks uh, with Carolina recruits as he's able to get a hold of them. So plenty of great stuff on the Gamecock Central Podcast Network. Great review and subscribe to that. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.